So I'll just directly jump into the next part of our program, which is uh, our keynote session. And uh, I'm really honored and uh, pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Jack Liu, um, who I should say is uh, a lead of our Convergence Science Catalyst team within iGUIDE. So uh, we've been working together for uh, now several years from the development of the iGUIDE project proposal to uh, this point, the execution of the project. So uh, I think Jack uh, is known to uh, many of us here and uh, he's, uh, he's trained as ecologist and uh, human uh, environment scientist. And uh, he's uh, uh, had a long distinguished career. He's a uh, Richard Carson Chair in Sustainability and uh, the founding director of the Center for Systems Integration and Sustainability at uh, uh, Michigan State University. Um, and he really is a pioneer for uh, what he titled here, this uh, metacoupling as well as uh, telecoupling approach to address this uh, interconnected aspects of uh, complex uh, social, economic, and environmental systems in the context of sustainability. Uh, so uh, his work is, uh, is quite impactful over years and decades and uh, getting featured in uh, not only through uh, publications, but also uh, uh, news media reported by Times Magazine and New York Times and so on. Um, and uh, certainly uh, his work has been recognized by uh, many of his accolades. Um, so um, I'll just mention a few examples. He's elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Philosophy, Philosophical Society and Ecological Society of America, uh, and also elect a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So I think I could keep going. That would need me to give another talk uh, to uh, really uh, explain, uh, you know, the, the the very amazing career he's had, but also the impact he has made on the field. But uh, without further ado, and in the interest of time, I'll give the floor to uh, to Jack. Thank you, very yeah, much. Thank you so much, uh, Xiaobeng, for your, um, your invitation and the kind words and introduction. And uh, it's my great honor and the pleasure to share some of the work that the, my collaborators, including students, the postdoc, and I have been doing the last few years. And um, this is a, a really a wonderful um, opportunity to uh, get feedback from you all as well um, when we talk about the convergence. And um, the title of my talk, as you see, is Meta Coupling, a New Convergence Frontiers for Global Sustainability. Um, I want to first uh, talk a little bit about the motivation behind this new frontier, and then introduce the integrated framework of meta coupling for those who are not familiar with, and then um, present some of the examples of multiple functions and global applications of the framework. And finally, discuss some challenges and opportunity in applying the framework. As we all know, we got a lot of global problems from aging infrastructure like dams that the show mentioned earlier, air pollution, biodiversity loss, climate change and water pollution shortage and so on and so forth. So the main reason I think behind these global problems are the impact of human activities. In other words, the human nature interactions from agricultural, urbanization and industrialization and consumption and so, so forth. So one also mentioned this United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and what the United Nations want to achieve those goals is to, by 2030, which is only a few years away from here, and to achieve those goals everywhere. So I would like to draw your attention about this word, everywhere, right? That's a very ambitious goal. And as we also know, the world is in increasingly interconnected. This, um, that, uh, 
show the global shipping network, and not just the extensive connection, but also the intensity, the magnitude of interactions, you know, in really increased exponentially. This is just the example of agricultural product trade. And with those kind of uh, interactions, we know that there are a lot of cross-boundary impact that even we do things in one place could have huge impact in other places. So, so how you know, we can address this issue, even for sustainability actions, like conserve forest in one place could cause deforestation in other places. So then the question is how to achieve SDGs everywhere. So this is a really a big challenge for our scientific community as well, because we are supposed to provide information for policymakers to make decisions. Right? So my argument is first we need kind of integrated frameworks. So this is how we develop this framework, what we call meta coupling. Okay, basically it's human nature interactions, and. Within a particular location, as you see here, right? We have humans, nature, interact with each other. This is what we call focal system. It could be a city, could be a country, could be a state, and, um, right? And, but also, it interact with adjacent systems, right? And adjacent system could be also include human and nature interaction. But the, the issue is that we are particularly interested in the interact. Furthermore, they also interact between distant systems, even they are far away. Right? So that's why we have this term, the intercoupling and pericoupling and, um, and telecoupling. Right? This is a kind of a, um, <clears throat> a systematic way of classifying those different types of uh, human nature interactions. For telecoupling, actually, is a umbrella and expanded concept, and that uh, of distant interaction in many disciplines. I'm going to give you some examples here. For those who are familiar with you know, animal migration, many species of animals migrate several thousand miles each year, and a lot of studies by ecologists on animal migration has focus on ecological and aspect of animal migration. But animal migration also have enormous social economic implications. If we consider both the social economic and the environment dimensions, then animal migration can be treated as a telecarbon process. So this is expand the, con the, the, uh, the concept here. On the other hand, is human migration had been extensively studied by economists, demographers, but mainly focused on demographic and uh, social economic aspect. But human migration, as we all know, has profound environment impact as well. So if we consider both social economic and environment dimensions of human migration, human migration can also be treated as a telecarbon process. The same with trade, had been extensively studied by um, economist, and, uh, but focus on the economic, mainly focus on the economic, social aspect. But trade has a lot of environmental impact as well. So if we consider all this together, then trade can be treated as a telecarbon process. The same with many other processes, like investment and um, you know, tourism, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, water transfer, and so on and so forth. Right? So with all this uh, different types of uh, telecarbon process. How can we address them in a comprehensive but also consistent way? That's why we developed this telecarbon framework. There are several major components here. One is what we call the sending system. It's a place to send something out. And um, the something out could be goods and product, could be people. In the case of trade, is 
can be treated as an exporting country. In the, in the case of uh, migration, can be treated as the original place of the migrants. Right? So the flows are the movement of people, goods, products, information, material, and energy, and so on and so forth. And then this flow will get to some places, and this place is called receiving system. In the case of trade, it's the importing country. In the case of uh, migration, it's uh, the destination of migrants. So there are also feedbacks among this. Right? And then there is another type of system that people don't pay attention as much as sending and receiving system is what we call spillover systems. Spillover systems are those places which are affected by the interaction by, between sending and receiving system, also through different types of flows. So within each system, we have three components. The causes, the reasons behind the flows, ecological reason, social economic reason, political reason, and so on and so forth. Also, the agents. The agents are the decision-making entity that facilitate the flows. And that you could have traders, you have policy makers, farmers which for producing product for export, for example. And also the effects are the consequences, ecological consequences or economic consequences or social consequences of the flow. Okay? So all this together, there may be the, you know, those causes, agents, effects, may be similar, may be different in across different systems. That makes things complex, right? That's but it's also reflected in the real world situation. And um, for the pairing of uh, coupling framework, it's basically the same as the telecoupling framework. But the difference is the sending and receiving systems are nearby rather than far away. Right? We also can have these uh, uh, other components. And then for intro coupling framework, it is considering uh, the interactions between human and natural systems be, uh, within a place. Right? But also have different sectors, different stakeholders that interact across the different organization levels. On the human, uh, the nature subsystem uh, side, we have animals, plants, and the microorganisms, and uh, uh, soil, and other abiotic factors, which also interact across different organization scales. They are connected through different uh, uh, flows, and um, also, uh, even they don't interact with other places, they may also have impact on other places. For example, if a closed system, you know, you have to consume energy. The emission of CO2 will affect the global climate. So that is a kind of spillover system that we also need to pay attention to. So if we consider all this multiple scale, this is a framework that can be applied to multiple scale from local to global scale, and also they're dynamic. We reflect the dynamics over time, from the past to the present to the future. Right? So this is a kind of a, a summary of the framework. Now I'm going to uh, show you some of the functions of and the applications of the framework. So because some of you may ask why you need this kind of framework. So I'm going to give you several examples here. Each example will be short, but will not tell you the whole, everything. But if you're interested, I will uh, show you uh, where to find those detailed information. Right? First is hope biodiversity conservation. And the biodiversity crisis is huge globally. Uh, we depend on biodiversity for many reasons, and we uh, depend on like, food and, and, and a lot of things. Right? And here, I'm just using uh, one example, the global wildlife icon, the, the giant pandas. And we developed this uh, framework and uh, based on the, our work in the nature reserve for panda conservation, we treat this reserve as a kind of a, a real world laboratory. And not just a, a room in a building, but it's a, the real situation here. And it's a flagship natural reserve for panda conservation. It was established in 1975, 
and uh, one of the largest nature reserves for panda conservation, and uh, has about 10% of the wild panda in it. Right? And then you have also local residents. A lot of nature reserves do not have, uh, in developed countries, do not have residents in it. But in developing countries like China, has a lot of residents there living there for centuries. And uh, it's harder to move them out. So this constitutes a really nice couple of human nature system because human local residents had to use resources there which also is shared by the pandas and the many other species. Right? So uh, this is uh, uh, a reserve that we have been working there since 96, 1996. So we use this reserve to generate ideas and develop methods. Then we apply those ideas and methods to other places around the world. Right? So we develop this uh, uh, first Part of this is the intro coupling framework to really understand the interaction between humans and natural systems in, within the nature reserve. Uh, we should consider the human local resident, right? They are also the abiotic factors, uh, uh, biotic factor like a forest, and then changing the forest will change the panda habitat because pandas rely on the forest as a shelter and as food, you know, bamboo, so understory species in the forest. The changes in the panda habitat will prompt the government to develop new policies. Those new policies will um, motivate people to have different uh, reactions, and they may change the perception, they may change the activity. Those activity will change the other factors again. So this form a, a feedback loop. And uh, this is caused a lot of uh, this complexity there. I'm not going to the details here, but uh, if uh, you're interested in, I'd be happy to share later. Right? And also has a lot of interaction with the rest of the world. I will show some examples uh, later. And also the pericoupling, the interaction between the natural reserve and the adjacent areas. And this is uh, the nature reserve here, the surrounding counties. The uh, girls from the surrounding counties they actually get married with boys inside the reserve because the quality of life inside the reserve is higher than the surrounding areas. So a lot of girls, that's only the only uh, legal way for people to move into the nature reserve. And also pandas, wild pandas, and uh, can move out to the reserve too, uh, outside of the reserve because there is no fence around the nature reserve. Nature reserve is about 2,000 square kilometer big, right? So it's harder to have a fence them. So the, those kind of interactions between the nature reserve and the surrounding areas. Also, I'm going to show you some examples of telecoupling between the nature reserve and the world. And uh, here, one is agricultural product. The farmers are the main uh, 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 resident inside the reserve that produce agricultural product and the, for, for themselves, but also for the outside market. Right? They sell the product, but also um, need to buy industrial products from outside, like fertilizer and the pesticides and to produce agricultural product. Another thing is information about the nature reserve disseminated through news media, through books to the outside of the world, and then uh, the conservation money, subsidies, were, is provided to the farmers inside the reserve. And then some pandas inside the reserve, in the breeding center, actually sent out to zoos around the world, including the pandas in Washington Zoo come from this nature reserve. Right? And then, on the other hand, people as tourists come from around the world to visit the nature reserve. So there are a lot of those kind of interactions so I apply this framework to um, uh, nature reserve, or like Onun, you have this kind of uh, uh, integration of telecarbon, pericarbon, and intracarbon, right? Then your question is, so why matter? Why you start this, right? And then what matters is, is we're trying to understand the mechanisms behind the loss and recovery of panda habitat. And in the past, the panda habitat, you know, even after the reserve was established, went down, right? 
until 2001, we published a paper reporting uh, the result in Science Magazine saying the, this kind of a problem. Even you have a natural disease, the habitat was still declining, lost actually faster before the reserve, uh, after the reserve established than before the reserve was established. So that was kind of surprising. That provided a wake up call for the government to develop new policies and uh, to implement this new policy by our co-authors and of this science paper. Right? And then since then, the panda habitat had been recovering. Not just the, this reserve, um, we uh, uh, habitat recovery, but also we apply the lessons and the experience from this nature reserve to other places for panda conservation. As a result, by 2016, the, United, uh, the International Union of Conservation of Nature and removed the giant panda from the endangered species list. Okay. So this just demonstrated the utility of the firm really trying to produce the information for policymakers, and then they can develop new policies to make adjustment to their policy, to the management, then as a result, and lead to this kind of a success. So that's, I think, when we talk about sustainability solution, this is one example. Right? And also, we apply the framework to address a lot of other issues, like broke conventional wisdom. And one example is that the uh, high-income countries damage biodiversity in low-income uh, countries through trade. So my uh, uh, form, uh, student and I did a study to really evaluate whether this conventional wisdom is correct or not. So we mapped this high-income country and low-income countries uh, worldwide, and we also uh, produce a map to show biodiversity hotspot distribution. By hard, uh, biodiversity hotspot are areas that which have high density of uh, wildlife and plant, wild plants. Right? And um, so um, we classify those countries into three categories. One is the areas where um, the countries has 50% of the territory with uh, biodiversity hotspot, we say the high biodiversity hotspot country in um, <clears throat> uh, dark uh, green here. Oh. In dark green here. And then low biodiversity hotspot countries means the uh, territory uh, is less than 50% uh, of the uh, area is bio high biodiversity areas. And then the red color means no biodiversity hotspot. And then we uh, also analyze the amount of for trade, uh, food trade, among those countries. What we find is that actually those countries, low-income countries, um, are net importers of food. Right? You can see low, uh, except this uh, low-income, no biodiversity hotspot, are the net export of food. Okay? And actually high-income, Countries like the U.S. are the net exporter of food. Okay? So this is just the them uh, in different years, 2000, 2018, and then the average of between 2000 and 2018. Okay? So this is just to illustrate the net import or net export of food in different countries. So the short the conclusion is that the international trade, food trade actually benefits biodiversity and food security in low income countries. So in other words, the high income uh, countries export more food than uh, to low income, con uh, low income countries than they import it. Okay. So low income countries, especially those with biodiversity hotspot, increasingly become net food import. So that's actually good news, and, uh, but also broke the conventional wisdom. So the next example that I'm going to show you is detected the hidden phenomena. Right? 
So one of the things that we have been working on is the Amazon area in Brazil. It's a global biodiversity hotspot, uh, rainforest and so on and so forth. So international um, uh, companies uh, signed agreement to reduce the impact on deforestation in uh, the tropical, uh, the Amazon area, right? Because they used to produce a lot of soybean or, or, or livestock by converting rainforest into cropland or pasture. So this is a, a supply chain agreement were quite effective to protect the Amazon area. But unfortunately, increased uh, deforestation in the other biodiversity hotspot, the Cerrado hotspot here. Right? So we analyzed two states, or uh, one in the Amazon area, the Para. You can see here, and uh, if there is no uh, trade, uh, the supply chain agreement, then the deforestation will keep this high. But with the agreement, the deforest, uh, deforestation rate was declined dramatically. Right? On the other hand, this is a state in the uh, Cerrado. If you have trade and uh, this agreement, then actually the deforestation rate is much higher than without the uh, agreement. That means you spread over the deforestation from Amazon area to the Cerrado area, right? So use this framework to help us to really understand the mechanism of this. And also, the framework had helped to expand the nexus approach. Nexus approach is the approach that uh, treat uh, a lot of interactions among different sectors and to simultaneously, like food, energy, water nexus, and it become very popular uh, topic right now. And, um, but they, they traditionally focus on one particular place, and you focus on this place, I focus on another place, but as we mentioned earlier, those places also uh, interact. So we expanded the, uh, the nexus approach by applying the, uh, the metacoupling framework to in in include not just the interaction within the system, but also like this uh, food, energy, water nexus example, but also with the adjacent system and with the distant system. Right? So this is really helpful. We also um, test this uh, in, in a major um, uh, food production area, North China Plain. Right? So rather than just focus on North China Plain, we also consider the other areas because the North China Plain produce, in order to produce food, which provide food for many other parts of our country, but also they need water because it's a, uh, they, they don't have enough water to produce. So one way to do that is to transfer water from south, southern China to northern China, to, including the North China Plain. Right? And they will affect the other places you know, in, uh, in southern part of China. So if you consider all this together, you consider this food, energy, water, and the CO2 emission, because to transfer water need to build this, uh, uh, the largest south to north China uh, water transfer plant. Right? And that will consume a lot of energy to do that. And that, that will uh, emit a lot of CO2. The specific numbers are shown here. I'm not going to the details here. But the point is that we need to consider not just one place, but needed to consider many other places related to this place. And the, uh, the next function of the framework is to challenge existing theories. This one is Tobler's first law of geography and had been uh, going on for a long time. Right? It's, it basically says near things are more related than distant things. And uh, uh, also uh, it had been widely used and uh, many leading scholars and <laughs> including Dr. Goodchild had also done a lot of wonderful work on this area. But my student and, um, had done a uh, Nick Manning here and uh, had done a literature review to see how, in what kind of situations, how frequently this first law um, uh, is valid. Okay. 
in what situation is not. And uh, he did a lot of those literature search and uh, find out and what this diagram shows in different categories of uh, situations, you know, like agricultural development, for example. Most of these are not valid. You know, no, and this is the likelihood that the first law is valid. And uh, you know, like yes, it's green, and uh, red is no, or likely no, and blue is likely yes. Okay? You can see this different category, agricultural development, conservation, governance, land use, land cover change, trade, and uh, species migration, and also tourism, and some miscellaneous. Right? You see a lot of those cases, this is percentage of the entrance that uh, 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 valid the first law or not valid the first law. Okay? The red, you can see a lot of red here. Right? So this is just the example to uh, show the potential of using the framework to exa re-examine the existing uh, principle, existing law or series. And uh, the uh, final <coughs> example of the application of the framework is to really reveal the effects of metacoupling on SDGs within and across the boundaries. As I mentioned in the very beginning, so if we want to achieve SDGs everywhere, then we have to consider what kind of impact in different places we'll have SDG within those different uh, countries. Right? So here is an example that my student and, and I did. Here is to evaluate the impact of international trade on SDGs in all countries. And um, within, uh, with the adjacent trade, that means with the trade between adjacent countries. And distant trade means the trade between distant countries. You can see here, if we have no trade, then the score of SDG will be the lowest over time. The higher the score, the better. Right? That means more progress had to be made towards uh, the goal. And uh, with the um, uh, uh, JSON trade, and that means uh, pay recovery, and that's the score is in the middle. And then with the distant trade, the score is highest. This is for all countries together. But if we consider which, part, which countries you know, we develop, uh, divided the country into two major categories. One is developed countries and another is developing countries. What we see here with trade and the developed countries and the high, highest score. With our trade, the developed country had the lowest score. Well, developing countries actually suffer from the trade until 2006, right? because the score for, uh, in the trade situation actually lower than without trade. So this is a, um, a example showing how different countries could benefit or suffer from this kind of uh, trade relationship. And this is just the, a, a map show which countries at the country level, how many they, uh, they color the, the uh, blue color, you know, highest, and you have uh, uh, the, those target increase the score, right? like U.S. and China and some European countries. They, um, some countries have really small number of target, SDG target, uh, uh, increase the score. On the other hand, this show the countries with declined scores in the target. The target the color, the more uh, uh, target with the declined scores. Right? So you see a lot of those developing countries actually suffered from this. This is consistent with the diagram show, yeah, show um, uh, earlier. The developed countries benefit more from the trade and developing countries suffer more from the trade. This all relate to the environment uh, target. Right? Not talk about the economic target. And finally, I'd like to uh, just uh, discuss briefly about some challenges and opportunities in applying the meta carbon framework. And the uh, first challenge is more complex, right? 
and because you have more system to consider and uh, we need to consider more trade-offs, the synergies among different system and need more resources to coordinate this kind of thing. Um, so that's the challenge part. But also the enormous opportunities. And one is the international interest in telecarbon, which is part of the metacarbon framework. You know, for example, the global land program has designated telecarbon as a research priority. And the 2021 Nobel Prize Summit actually featured telecarbon. And the many influential United Nations reports featured telecarbon. The European Commission actually established a PhD program in telecarbon. The first cohort had 15 PhD students, all focused on telecarbon. And uh, also the media coverage, the, like Time Magazine, called the new science of telecarbon, showed just the, the, how connected the world is. You know, they have positive effects or have negative effects. And also, even the high-level United Nations officials write about telecarbon. The title is Telecarbon and Why Your Choice Matters for the Planet. Because this is show telecarbon or metacarbon is not just a scientific issue. It's an issue that uh, related and, uh, everybody, every citizen on the earth. And we need to care about this kind of issues. And I get, I think, and the international community can really hope to further quantify and predict and meta carbon uh, at the multiple scales. As uh, show one showed it nicely in the, uh, the table that he showed, you know, this, uh, the impact of uh, damp fair. Right? Here is uh, another example how we could address this kind of issues, you know, meta carbon, the cascading effects of human activities or uh, environment change in one place could have uh, impact on many other places, like in the sending system or receiving system or spare over system. It, there may be different situations. Maybe sometimes they're all positive, everybody's happy, but also sometimes all negative, everybody's crying. And sometimes you may have positive effects on sending system and negative effects on uh, uh, spare over system. Then we don't know what will happen, net, uh, net, net outcome. Right. So that requires really detailed and innovative research to find these kind of issues. And there are many other topics that I think is important. Trace flows between sending and receiving system and spillover system across scales around the world. And also understand the feedbacks among different systems and then evaluate the relative importance of telecarbon, pericarbon, or intracarbon. And then the interrelationship among them, and also use the information for developing effective uh, policies and actions. Right? So let me just quickly summarize, you know, meta coverings are human nature interactions within system, between adjacent system, and between distant system. And they can have enormous positive or negative Im impact on sustainability across local to global scale and also the research is really new. You know, it's just a few years old actually since the uh, development of the framework, but has really promising, uh, you know, a potential, you know, the convergence of many things, different areas, different issues, different uh, scales, and different disciplines. And also the framework has multiple functions. I'm just giving a few examples here, but the many uh, uh, more examples are already published. And also it's useful for multiple scale and uh, helpful to address different issues, including these global problems that I uh, mentioned earlier, and then can help transform research on human nature interactions and uh, provide the essential information for global sustainability. And uh, also acknowledge the funding agencies and numerous collaborators, including student postdoc and like, um, uh, Tom Hedo, and actually we're <laughs> discussing a new proposal for NSF right now, applying the meta carbon framework with uh, his colleagues and others here. And uh, here finally, is, this is uh, a uh, website, and uh, if you're interested in more publications and so on and so forth. So thank you so much, appreciate your time. Thank you.